welcome everybody joining us today. I'm very curious if you can answer the question how you become a successful founder today, but I'm sure that we have um, a lot of experience in our round today. So uh, really please ask questions. Um, what is on your mind? What you think might be helpful to guide your own entrepreneurial journey? And uh, it's great to have both a um, an entrepreneur with us who actually well, brought it to the next, next, next level by IPOing the company. And Tanya, who um, has uh, is a serial entrepreneur, it's not your first startup. Um, and uh, the financing round that you just closed is not with just anybody, but with basically the who is who of the German entrepreneurial scene. Those people investing, like Verena Pausda, Elia Sophie Kramer, and others, um, they know what they're doing. So it's really, really good to see that much support for your idea. Although I have not tried your product yet. Um, so um, please, the, the way we want to do it today is um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Um, I am uh, happy to start with Tanya, ladies first, um, and then move over to Dirk. And um, do we surprise you as well when we ask you questions, Stefan, yes. since you're an entrepreneur as well? I thought yeah. that was my briefing for tonight. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah, you, you, you can. <laughs> we, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to make this an open discussion. Um, although my entrepreneurial experience is a little bit outdated, maybe, but we will see. Um, so, so, Tanya, the first question that interests me um, of both of you is why actually did you decide to start a company? I mean, um, graduating from, uh, from HHL, especially in the MSc, former diploma program, um, a typical career path would be to go into a high paid consulting job. So why actually start a company? Yeah, excellent, excellent uh, intro question, uh, Stefan, and hi, and a very warm well welcome um, from, from my side uh, as, as well. The counter question is rather why not, right? Um, and honestly, when I, when I made it to HHL, um, my clear path was indeed uh, just getting into financial uh, consulting, getting like deep into the iBanking game, um, and it's and it's actually very special because uh, the person uh, who created the company first, where I got bitten by the startup bug, is actually Dirk, uh, where I started my career yeah, in entrepreneurship, um, where I joined um, just after graduation. Um, I got bitten by the startup bug. I was just so intrigued by this amazing work that Mr. Spex has been doing in fundamentally disrupting one of the most traditional industries that they are, yeah, like, um, and then by digitalizing um, a medical product. Um, and, and this is, um, yeah, this, this has been, been my, my journey that brought me into, into retail, future of retail, and ultimately now into the future of food, yeah, and this question like, um, how do we actually, uh, how do we actually redefine um, the way we consume food? So, um, that, that, that's, that's basically it, yeah? The key question is, um, it sounds much more complicated than it is. Yes, um, founding a company is, um, is very challenging. It's also um, the environment that offers the steepest learning curve, yeah? Um, that, that there is in, in all different ways, yeah, ever to imagine. Um, and, and that is actually how I got in, uh, in doing what I'm doing now by just simply asking why not and uh, how, how to make things happen. Thank you, Tani, uh, Tanya. Um, Dirk, what's your perspective? Um, and that said, I mean, um, Tanya, you mentioned that Dirk has been an inspiration uh, for your own entrepreneurial journey. Um, and Dirk, uh, you're known for actually helping many, many uh, individuals and teams uh, taking this first very important step and motivating them to start up their own company. So what's your take? Why did you decide to leave a, a great job at a consulting company <clears throat> to start your own company? So I think for me, um, it was during my time at HHL um, where I got to know a lot of, I would say, entrepreneurial driven people. Um, that I got inspired. And I also did internships in startup companies <coughs> at the time. 
So maybe just to frame it, I studied in Leipzig 2003 to 2005. So it's quite some time ago. And that, was, that wasn't known for a great entrepreneurial environment at the time, right? Um, I would say it was um, after the dot-com bubble, but before it really took off um, again in maybe 2008, 2009. And um, uh, so for me, sometimes it's easier basically to um, understand what I don't want to do and uh, then rather tend to say what I'm exactly going to do. So I did start my career um, even before HHL. So between 97 and 2000, I did a dual degree program with a, a German bank. Um, I actually studied in Leipzig um, in a um, Berufsakademie at the time. And during my time in, uh, in this bank that I <coughs> was working for, I just learned um, this was a bank with more than 30,000 employees, really old processes and so on. Uh, very traditional and I just within the three years I knew okay you never want to work there De definitely um, and um, then um, I did my work in startups right so in 2003 I worked at eBay at the time still a very cool company right um, nobody wanted to um, uh, I would say uh, invest in heavy assets um, Amazon at the time wasn't seen as a very successful business right um so everybody wanted to invest in pure digital platforms without big investments and ebay was very profitable growing and so on at the time great people um and 2004 i was uh, at yamba at the time this mobile content business sometimes call it the um, ringtone mafia right um and um but what i uh, uh, learned there and i was responsible for a huge marketing budget in the end to negotiate um, as an intern. Um, so I was modeling basically the TV uh, purchasing um, or TV advertising purchasing of 50 million euros as an intern. And the, the guy that run, uh, was running the, the marketing and the business development was basically trusting me that um, he challenged me obviously on a few things, but um, I was um, basically onboarding a lot of new country managers and so on. So. I was just fascinated how um, a company can grow that fast and how much ownership you can take over. Um, so, um, so for me at graduation of HHL, I was pretty much clear that I want to become an entrepreneur one day. Unfortunately, um, I left HHL with a debt of 25,000 euros and no money in the bank. Um, so for me, I've, I didn't think it was the right time to start a business. And um, uh, so I went into consulting, worked at BCG for two and a half years. Um, also, I mean, I don't regret it at all. So I learned quite a lot of stuff there. Um, <clears throat> but I also knew when I joined, I don't want to be there five years from now. And um, so um, after two and a half years, I had a pretty shitty project with a um, asshole partner, and which was basically uh, an easy reason to leave and then to start Mr. Specs. So although it was well paid, yes, um, you're right. Um, my mom yeah. never understood what I'm doing at BCG, but then she never understood why I left BCG. <laughs> well, of course, I knew all the time what I'm doing at BCG. <laughs> um, but I, I can share um, I can share the experience. Um, uh, typically in consulting uh, companies, back in the days, you had something we called the Office Friday. So four days a week, you were the client. And on Friday, you were in the office. And um, like all the colleagues in my office um, on Friday, we're basically surfing and thinking and discussing about, okay, how fast can I quit this job? Yeah. And uh, what should I be doing as an entrepreneur? Yeah. So it, it was really a thing that people said, I wanna, I wanna really move and shake the world and add value, but I have no idea what. And this was going on like uh, for, I, I spent there for two years and for two years on Fridays, we were talking business ideas. Okay, um, but um, another thing that's interesting, uh, Dirk, maybe we start with you here, um, selling glasses online. Really? Wow. <laughs> I mean, come on, I, you, you need an optician. That's, that's what I learned uh, from, from experience since I'm a, a small child. And then you come and say, uh, well, that sounds like a good idea. Let's just skip the optician and we send them the glasses online. 
uh, how did you come up to that idea that when you started it actually was quite crazy to say honestly yeah um <clears throat> you're right um so i was i'm i was wearing glasses as a child and then again somewhere in 11th or 12th grade in high school <clears throat> because i didn't see very well from the far, the last row right uh, so <clears throat> um i would say that i was never a founder that was able to tell that story you know Uh, my glasses broke somewhere. I needed a new pair, and they ripped me off. So I I, I quit that story on day one. Um, but um, for me, as a consultant, and also being at Yamba, very number driven, I just looked. Um, uh, I, first of all, I thought about where can I actually add most value, right? So where, uh, from my experience, from what I know, um, I might have a little bit of an advantage versus others. And um, so eBay, Yamba were clearly digitally driven businesses. So I had some idea about, I would say, online marketing, product management, and um, how to run a digital company. Um, and then at BCG, I worked in uh, retail um, and corporate finance projects mainly. Um, so putting all of that together at the time, for me, it felt most, I would say, reasonable to start in e-commerce. I still was quite attached to physical products um right in 2007 um maybe i was too old for a pure digital um product at the time i needed actually to open a facebook account when i started mr specs which i didn't have um i don't have it today anymore so um i quit all of that stuff the only social network that i'm using is linkedin um and um uh, so for me it was about a great, uh, like a big market, a large market uh, with high margins, attractive unit economics, and no one there online, and a clear customer need, I would say. That's how we started, Mr. Specs. And um, yes, um, I think it was a little bit naive to think selling glass online is easy. Um, that was a benefit uh, that we've been naive on that. Um, I think another benefit was that It was a, a large existing market, so we didn't need to create demand for a new product. The demand was there. We just wanted to shift it from the offline to the online world and provide a better customer experience. So I would say not too many um, question marks um, on the business plan, only how does it work online or on the channel. So that's why um, I would call it still a conservative um, startup um, idea. Um, But I would say over the time of the years, it did work out. Right. Um, uh, thanks. So, so I liked, the, I mean, your growth story based pretty much on multi-channel also. I'm very happy to uh, tell everybody who didn't know that there was a student team from HHL who you tasked with uh, thinking about a multi-channel yes. offline approach, mm -hmm. uh, designing the first store um, of Mr. Specs actually so that that was quite cool i really was i mean there's a strong network at hhl of entrepreneurs and business angels who support hhl alums uh, starting their own businesses i know you also had hhl alums uh, mm -hmm. funding your business um uh, there was one moment in time so i, I always um thought it was a pity that um i wasn't allowed to invest But I really got angry when Goldman Sachs invested the 50 million. That was really <laughs> when I said, okay, come on. <laughs> uh, why didn't you ask me? Um, no, but, but uh, really a great story that you're having here. Um, and, and I think that is interesting to see that when you, you started online, and let's make a comparison to Jeff Bezos, who started with the idea, I'm selling books online. And basically, a, ba a big empire developed out of that, not necessarily having something to do with online anymore. And I see at least um, some similarities by moving into the offline world, by moving into multi-channel. And when you know the glasses market, actually, there's so much growth potential going there because there, there's still a leap from where Mr. Speck stands today to um, the big households' names of today, let's say, like FEMA and others. So there's a, a huge market opportunity. Um, Tanya, <laughs> perfect. Um, why? And, and uh, explain, to, explain to our uh, guests what you are actually doing. Yeah, um, so you mean 
how to move from fashion to food actually with uh, and bringing um, uh, uh, yeah adding adding a lot of sense uh, to that so um, maybe to sh share a little bit of background um, from like my personal entrepreneurial journey because it also had a um, significant impact um, on why I do today what I'm doing that is taking the chicken out of the egg equation um, and rethinking the egg with plants and state-of-the-art technology yeah um, so what I mentioned earlier um, so this this experience at Mr. Specs that got me into the future of retail and this question what's the role that technology has to play um, for for that um, got me to my first company that was a fashion tech company a curated shopping provider um, just you might be uh, familiar with outfittery for example um, and um, sorry just saw your comment Dirk. yes <laughs> I also prefer just uh, speaking into faces uh, and not icons um, so um, I, I started my first company uh, which was an online personal shopping service for men um, and I very quickly learned two things one in order to scale the business via technology uh, and not simply via people, we needed access to data points. And it turned out that men weren't the right target group to share uh, like what kind of clothing items they are buying, what kind of sizes they have in which brands, etc. And two, and this is very essential for what I'm doing today uh, with, with my colleagues, Timing is key. Window of opportunity is everything that counts. Um, and back then we were the first ones on the market. We clearly underestimated the effort that's needed to fundamentally change uh, consumption behavior, namely how do we actually shop online? How do we shop fashion items um, that is happening outside of our, let's say Berlin and maybe Silicon Valley uh, bubble. Um, so that's when we pivoted the model um, towards, towards women. Um, I started Kisura, online personal shopping for women. And with Kisura, I have gone through the entire life cycle of a startup. Yeah, So from pioneering, um, pioneering the market, uh, getting the first 100,000 paying customers, um, only by leveraging uh, PR, storytelling, content marketing, um, quickly scaling teams and operations. Uh, navigating many valley of death on the go, um, including uh, chapter 11 management in early 18. We restructured the company, sold it to Kasha Department Store Group, where it's still up and running, um, managed within the portfolio. Um, and after this smooth or less smooth, like it is how it is, yeah, these uh, processes are very intense. Um, a post M&A integration phase, I was simply facing the question, what do I want to get up for in the morning? Yeah, And I knew back then that I wanted to move along the uh, impact profit axis. I didn't know really uh, how I would determine impact, what impact means for me, but I just knew I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't find it. Sorry, I'm getting I would not find it in uh, in retail. So this was when I stepped out to the sideline, started to help other entrepreneurs building their companies, making better decisions faster, and how I got into agritech, yeah, where I have um, started to um, build in, in as part of advisory boards um, and uh, investment committee um, on VC side. Um, I I got very deeply into food into um, the entire value chain of, uh, of food and where I just realized how broken the chicken egg system is. And I had this idea, I, I just realized like in times where it's normal to eat burgers without beef and to drink milk without cow, it has to be possible to just displace the world's most popular, the most um, the the, the um, yeah, the most popular animal protein, yeah, by um, by just taking the animal out of that equation, and this is how we um, how this idea for 
for perfect that is egg without chicken was was born and i teamed up again uh, with one of my um, investors from the early days with whom i have gone through this entire roller coaster and life cycle of the uh, startup uh, life uh, we teamed up with the former head of r d of rügenwalder mühle who has built the entire market leading portfolio of alternative meat products. I'm sure you know the Schinken Spicker and Co. So uh, Bernd, Bernd has been building this, um, this, this, this entire uh, portfolio um, and also teamed up with trailblazers from the food industry to really build perfect as a yeah, global food love brand that make people, I always say, make them forget why hands were needed in the first uh, place yeah so but this has been the reason why i'm sharing this um uh, and i'm providing a bit of context is just there are always there is not this one path to idea finding and then building a business out of that like there is a very analytical approach and it can also be a very intrinsic uh, driven uh, approach um, to that but it's just very important to build a system um, and here clearly HHL's experiences um, have helped me personally a lot to build a system just to make better decisions faster yeah um, in in this entire venture building space so to not being purely driven by passion I mean this is the fuel in the first place but passion doesn't build lasting businesses uh, as such. Anya, um, thank you very much. You, you laid out a couple of um, baits across the way. Um, learning how to become a successful entrepreneur um, includes a lot of fuck ups. So what happened at Kizura? Yeah, a lot of challenges happen, yeah, um, and, and I mean, we have fallen and it's really interesting um, because I very clearly remember one, uh, one open lecture um, in, in my, so I'm MSc3, um, so uh, master, master of Science program. Um, and I very uh, well remember um, a, a session with Jan Nitschaika, who is nowadays a partner at uh, HVC, back then serial entrepreneur. And he was sharing his experiences of this journey. And he was like, yeah, and then we like ran again out of money and I was sitting there student row, you know, thinking, hey, how can this happen actually? Like, why wouldn't you see this? Um, uh, like that, um, you know, how, how not to de-risk a startup as such. And then boom, like six years later, we were just falling into the exact same trap and that is running out of cash. Yeah, so um, we weren't profitable back then um, together with our shareholders we made the deliberate decision to go for growth yeah and not profitability in this case we and what's actually even more special we were coming from a position of profitability but we decided we wanted to grow faster we wanted to move faster so we were hitting hitting the red zone again um, and then very last minute a fundraising round burst and this is like what this is the ugly truth. This can always happen. Um, that's why from the entrepreneurial side, the only thing that counts is when is the money actually hitting the bank account, just because a lot can happen on, on the go. And this is also what happened um, at, at Kisura. Yeah. And then there was a time where um, as, as a founder, we were just with our back, like trapped in a corner. And we were like the only way to create a path forward um, is to go for a chapter 11 management yeah and this is I mean this is what nobody talks about this is one of the biggest challenges in uh, in entrepreneurial uh, lives um, stats show that nine out of ten companies fail yeah um, so it's uh, it, it is the the, the the challenging truth but at the same time um, and here network kicks in again. Um, there's also ways of doing of doing things better. Yeah, but this is what what happened at Kisura back then. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, I think that's also a big um, thing that people need to remember that um, 
as an entrepreneur, we, we read in news about all those success stories and the glorious life of entrepreneurs and all the freedom, but the path there is actually a tough path and nobody is uh, giving any uh, presence along the way. You have to work for everything and there might be drawbacks, there might be setbacks. And the important thing is um, to really uh, get up again, learn from them and move on, I believe at least. Um, now, the, the elephant in the room a little bit is, um, and Sigurd mentioned that we're introducing now finally um, a own entrepreneurship track. So a master basically with a focus on entrepreneurship at HHL. Now, some people say you can't teach entrepreneurship. What's your personal take on that, Tanya? So what you can, I mean, it's a, it, it's actually quite a tough question um, because I'm, I'm personally convinced that yes, you cannot, you, you can't learn every eventuality of just getting getting into this um, this roller coaster of uh, of company building and of entrepreneurship but what you can learn are the tools the frameworks to take the plunge in the first place to build better systems all along the way to make better decisions faster and when speaking about systems um, and, and then here referring back to these three T yeah, that I mentioned like that I mentioned earlier, how to actually identify topics of interest, how to actually identify um, if the timing is right, timing in terms of is the market ready or like somewhat ready for the product? What are the timelines? needed um, to, to make it to a mass market. Um, and what's also the situation on the capital market? Yeah, to give you one example, um, with Kisura, fashion tech, we were so late to the party, like with fashion e-commerce. Yeah, um, so it was just e-commerce. So much capital has been burned before. So investors have really become much more cautious in their entire investment pattern. So yeah, we were just, it, it became more and more difficult to receive funding for a specific business model. Whereas now, if we look at everything that's climate tech related, everything that's um, alternative protein related, et cetera, um, we are at the beginning of funding circles. Yeah. So topic timing is key. And also um, to like, yeah, put emphasis on this last T that is team team is what always makes the difference yeah and um and we can learn and i also learned it um also a little bit the hard way of just um determining what makes an outstanding team a rock star team yeah what are actually the skills necessary on founders level on c level on like the entire organizational level um to just get to the the confidence level that like this team is either finding a way or creating a way to make things happen. And this can be learned. Yeah, this is where like very, um, very clear systems can be put in, uh, can be put in place. Thank you, Tanya. Dirk, what's your take? Yeah, I think uh, Tanya mentioned all or most of the relevant things and I do agree, right? I think, um, uh, I did my, um, what is it, uh, 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 major at HHL was entrepreneurship and the other one was operations management, I think. Um, <clears throat> at least these were the two that I was able to select at the time. Um, I would say, yes, it definitely helps you to avoid certain pitfalls um, when starting your own business. Um, it also gives you probably the basics and um, helps you to provide professionalize the idea that you may have as a as a business idea and um <clears throat> and the second thing which Tanya mentioned as well um and i think that is one of my biggest learnings is um build a great network for two reasons one is you need to hire a lot of people if you're successful and have access to certain or different networks so i was able to um basically <coughs> reach out to people that i got to know 
at eBay, at Yamba, at BCG, at HHL. And uh, the more heterogeneous these networks are, the better, right? Um, because you need different skills and different people um, to work with. And second, um, which is important, I think, as well, if you start your own business, there will always be situations where you want to get some um, real experience or real life experience from others that may um, face similar issues, right? And to have basically a handful of people that you really trust that you can openly discuss all the things that are not working um, um, is very important because um, only there you get basically um, maybe some advice, <coughs> maybe some experiences, um, people that help you. Because yeah, I mean, my experience, if, if you go to startup um, career uh, events or uh, VC events or whatever kind of conferences, it always works very well for everybody, right? Um, which typically is not the real life. And uh, therefore, um, I think you need to have people um, ideally in a very similar situation. So other entrepreneurs, it doesn't help you if you have a lot of managers, um, people from consulting to give you advices because they don't face the same issues, right? And that's why I think it's great to have a good peer group um, when you start your own business. No, I agree. Um, and um, uh, I remember when <laughs> I was introduced to the Entrepreneurs Organization by you um, many, many years ago. Uh, and, and that is basically a network of people, like-minded people. My own experience, um, I mentioned in the chat, I've been lucky enough to, to do teaching in, in the context of entrepreneurship for over 20 years. And I agree with what you and Tanya said. Um, you cannot learn about getting the idea, uh, you cannot learn about, uh, you know, uh, changing your personality. But there are two things I believe that you can actually learn. First is, as you said, the processes. Um, like, you know, how do you build up a value chain? How do you do this? How do you do that? How do you ask the right questions? But the other thing, and this is now from my very personal experience is, um, you can learn slash get the inspiration. Um, Sigrid Fischer mentioned that in the beginning, I spent a couple of years at Siemens. Actually, I come from a Siemens family. So my grandma was from Siemens. My dad worked at Siemens. My aunt worked at Siemens. My uncle. We lived in a Siemens apartment. Um, so obviously, Stefan started his career at Siemens as an apprentice. And I, I never had thought about, you know, starting my own business. I mean, just not because I didn't like it. But because it was it was it was just not there. I, I, it was not just not an option. And then I came to HHL in the in the nineties, and I studied with people with young uh, fellow students um, who were talking day in day out about you know what could we start, what what company could we do could we be making. It was a time when the Summer Brothers, who later founded Jamba, the ringtone mafia, as you mentioned, as you said. Um, it was a time when the Summer Brothers started Alando and sold it after 100 days. And, and it was all about discussing, okay, what could we do? What could we do? We don't want to work for McKinsey. We don't want to work for Siemens. Um, and uh, for me, this was really enlightening because I was put in a different network, in a different ecosystem, in a different um, uh, set of people and mindsets that opened up a whole new world. And I think that is also something that, that you can benefit from um, if, you, if you decide to actually get into these networks, because this mutual inspiration is, I believe, very, very important. Yeah, and, but I do agree, Stefan, with you. But on the other hand, you just need to do it, right? And to learn, because, in, uh, I mean, you cannot learn how to uh, how it is to hire somebody or to, to fire or to um, learn which mistakes you, you need to make mistakes to learn, right? And if you don't do it, um, theory is nice. Um, but um, yeah, in the end, it's really something um, you need to start something or work at least in this environment um, to, uh, to learn some stuff. Yeah, and I, and I think um, learning from experience of others is important. Uh, mm -hmm. Carlos, uh, you mentioned um, in the chat that uh, it can be taught or uh, you can teach and mentor another entrepreneur. I think an important aspect in entrepreneurship education and also in the networks is 
not that I myself as an entrepreneur um, try to put all my wisdom on somebody, but that rather I talk about the experiences I made in a maybe similar setting. Mm -hmm. Because um, as, as Paul said, the, the paths are so individual, the contexts are so individual. Yeah. So I would never try to tell somebody, this is what you have to do. But I would rather say, okay, you know what? I've been in a similar uh, situation and that was my experience. And this is what I did. And this is how, you know, what happened. Now you can take that, you can learn from that if you want to, but you don't need to take my advice because your situation is very, very particular. Okay, uh, so, so another question that uh, I might be having, uh, Tanya, um, and, and rather explicitly, something, how did then actually HHL, so, so what, what are the top two things where you said, if I wouldn't have went to HHL, I would probably not have known this, which makes me a successful founder now. Was it the teaching? Was it the people? Was it the access? What, what was it that you say, this really made a difference for me? One, people, yeah, be getting, getting in touch with people who have gone through that path. And two, getting the courage of just asking myself better questions what i uh what i meant uh, initially as well with regards to why not when if not now and who if not me yeah um starting to to tackle tackle a, a problem yeah clearly clearly these two things and Dirk? Yeah, for me, it was also, I would say the, um, I just took some notes and said, okay, for me, it was first a mindset um, and um, just sharing some experiences, what happened to me, right? I mean, at the time at HHL, uh, the guy that was running our entrepreneurial marketing course, um, 2003, four at HHL was Florian Heinemann. Um, Florian uh, was uh, is now um, running one of the most successful VC funds, uh, um, and uh, he was also at eBay. No, he was at Yamba and uh, supported many other businesses in growing their marketing, their online marketing. So, second, the way I got my internship at Yamba, um, I was studying in Hong Kong at the time, uh, Hong Kong, uh, the partner university from HHL. So I actually had the great idea to, after my internship at eBay, to apply for an internship at Siemens, Bosch, or Daimler. Um, but uh, because I thought I never went to a large industry conglomerate, so try to apply there. So all the responses that I've got is, yeah, um, if you don't um, look for an internship for six months, that's not going to work for us. And if you cannot come over for an interview, we also cannot hire you. Um, so then I started to search what other opportunities are there. So I, for, um, I was searching, um, I don't know, some of these job <coughs> um, boards. Um, I found the, the, um, the ad from Yamba. <coughs> so I applied and um, from Hong Kong and um, three hours after I sent the application, Oli Zambar in person um, wrote me an email, Dirk, great CV. Um, so um, that's going to be your salary. Um, Agatha is going to send you the contract. We see each other on July 1st. So that was that was the hiring. Oli Zambar himself. Um, at the time, Yamba was already a business doing a few hundred million in sales and um, probably running at three, four hundred um, employees already. Right. And um, then I also um, had the pleasure to get to know Lukas, um, HHL alumni, who then helped me basically in starting um, Mr. Specs and also funding Mr. Specs. And basically, <coughs> um, he got me all the contacts to all the VCs. 
Um, so I never needed to call, cold call anybody. So just to give you an idea um, what um, uh, HHL meant to me um, uh, and uh, starting Mr. Specs. Thank you. Um, I, I posted a couple of links because um, obviously um, those of us who are in the bubble know all these names like Florian, uh, Oli, Lukas and others. Um, but just to say, if, if you're talking about entrepreneurship and digital entrepreneurship in Germany, uh, those are very, very influential names. Um, and they all have uh, a connection to HHL. Olive Zamba has hired so many HHL alums, uh, has okay. funded so many startups, uh, including Trivago, <laughs> was the first investor, actually, the first external investor that we had. Um, so uh, you cannot actually uh, say enough about how those people spurred the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Germany. Um, the, the, the thing I'm always wondering, I have my, I, I have a slide, uh, you know, coming from BCG, I'm very slide oriented to this day. Um, and I have a slide that says, I have, I have three and a half hypotheses, how to spur entrepreneurship in Germany or how to spur entrepreneurship with students. And uh, the half hypothesis is, that I say, um, or let, let's say the first hypothesis is uh, going back to entrepreneurship is nothing that is being seen as being, you know, something to aspire. Like from the German culture, the German society um, is not in favor of people starting their own businesses, totally contrary to, for example, uh, the United States. Do Did you experience that along your way and that that did this have any impact on your entrepreneurial journey? Maybe Dirk, you start. Yeah, I think that happens quite often, right? Um, and uh, it happened in the beginning um, when it was more like, oh, what a crazy idea. Why did you become, oh, why, why did you throw away your BCG job, um, which was paying, I don't know, 100,000 euros plus a year. Um, and um, it holds on until today, um, I would say it's, I mean, entrepreneurship or like starting your own business, um, I think Tanya mentioned it also, um, is always like a roller coaster, right? So there are great times when Stefan reads in the news that Goldman Sachs invested 50 million um, in Mr. Specs. And uh, I can tell you 12 months later, that wasn't that great, right? Um, and not because of Goldman, but uh, because the business didn't work that well at the time. And um, and I think we went bankrupt almost three times um, until the IPO. And um, uh, so um, I think that uh, that's one. Um, you also sometimes are in the press because um, uh, you have had an IT hack, um, which we had, um, you sometimes are in the press that you need to fire people or lay off people, right? Um, because the business isn't working that great. Um, you, um, I'm not sure what comes next, but um, if you are running a public company um, and execute uh, 10 year old stock options and sell them, then somebody might see that you make 3 million that year, um, which uh, might also create some, I don't know, um, uh, misunderstanding. So there is, I think, a lot of, uh, if you're su financially successful, also um, people, um, at least in Germany, right, um, think that uh, this is something um, where it creates some, what is, I don't know, what's the um, German word or like the English word for night, um, greed, is it? Um, not, not sure. And, um, and <coughs> um, so, uh, and as an entrepreneur, you need to take a lot of, I would say, um, um, tough decisions, which are not always pleasant. And that's why you're basically the CEO or whatever, the founder of that business. And uh, uh, that holds uh, true until today, that even within the company, it's sometimes it's hard uh, to explain why you took that decision. Sometimes it's gut feeling, sometimes it's I would say deep analysis, uh, like um, based on deep data analysis, whatever, they say, no, we need to um, change something which hurts other people, right? And that is, um, I think the way you do it makes a big difference, but you need to take these decisions. Thank you. Tanya, what are your experiences in that term? 
Um, yeah. Starting with um, just personally sharing, when I started my first company, I went to my grandmother and told her about it, you know, the, the one that's worked at Siemens for decades. She declared me nuts. When I started my second company, she actually wanted to write me out of her will. Sorry, Tanya. Yeah, no, I can uh, I can only second what uh, the two of you just uh, just shared. Um, I mean, it is um, going down the entrepreneurial path is um, isn't the norm, unfortunately yet. Yeah, um, but this is like it's. It comes with a different risk profile. Uh, it comes with a different set of opportunities, but also with like huge, huge challenges all along the way. And um, like the public loves these stories of overnight successes, etc. But there is like the truth is there is no such thing as an overnight success. Yeah, like um, it's it's always just a bumpy road um, and. Um, also, like you, you just said, Dirk, like there are highs, and in entrepreneurship, these highs can be higher than anywhere else, yeah, in any other um, environment. But the lows are deeper than anywhere else. And as someone who has gone through this life cycle, yeah, who has done, like, who has firsthand failure experience, yeah, I can just share that going through this path has been like, has been the hardest school of life while at the same time gaining so much strength from it that it's now even so much easier. Yeah, just like to stand up again and to, um, to start all over again, uh, knowing that there will, be, there will be even more failures to come, but the goal is just to build again a system that's one, de-risking, yeah, so to just, uh, somehow build in these security networks um, and two, moving, uh, moving faster and um, involving, uh, involving more, more people as also a strategy of, uh, of de-risking. Yeah? So, um, and, and I love these comparisons between like the US American perspective on entrepreneurship and the German perspective of entrepreneurship. It's like one of the most beautiful stereotypes. Yeah, like Germans are so often failure based um, thinking in terms of, well, of course it didn't work out. Yeah, again, looking at the stats, nine out of 10 companies fail, whereas like Americans are looking at it completely differently, saying, the worst thing that can happen is like not trying it. Um, and it's just very encouraging to see as the ecosystem matures, not only in Germany, but in all of Europe, um, that we see a shift here as well. Yeah, And this is also what I always experienced in the uh, HHL network, um, like even in the earlier days and now with like more, um, more entrepreneurs, um, bigger bigger network um, that there is an there's a dynamic starting um, where these support systems yeah so entrepreneurs supporting each other I'm also like a huge advocate of entrepreneurs organization um, and um, where also people invest into each other in the end it's all about creating cap table access yeah um, and just being part of a of such a nucleus in the ecosystem is from my personal experience something that money simply can't buy yeah because um yeah that's that's how it is my two cents um i also can second that thank you very much um Dania, you had why why did you decide actually to take on investors I mean, is it, is it because your business model just requires investment? And, and what are your experiences? I mean, you have gone through the whole life cycle, as you mentioned. Um, uh, first of all, why did you actually get money again in Germany when Kisura didn't work out? And now you come up with a new idea, which is totally new. That's uh, a very German then, question, and then, Stefan. And then you tell them, <laughs> you know what? I don't sell fashion anymore. I sell eggs, but it's not <laughs> eggs. But give me money, please. Yeah. <laughs> 
so repeating to the very stereotype uh, uh, question here, um, it's so, no, but one, um, one, like, I mean, the archetype of entrepreneurship, and again, there is no such thing as this one fits all approach of what is the right type of financing, etc. what we just know, and I can also share from personal experiences, entrepreneurs tend to chronically underfund their businesses, yeah, just because we're always too optimistic on the revenue side and too conservative on the cost side. And actually, this entire system needs to be flipped. So building a company, building a business model, building something like a category definer is just so much more expensive usually than it seems at first glance. This is the first thing. And this is, again, also something um, where I think experiences from others help uh, avoiding avoiding these, um, these traps. Um, so it really depends on the type of business model. I mean, fashion tech, super capital intense, yeah? Food tech, even more. So um, this is a, it's, it's a complete, di completely different industry where um, like heavy investments into, depending on the strategy, um, and as, as long as you are not into, fast moving consumer goods, um, it we have long cycles, long research and development cycles, many iterations, very capital intense processes. Um, educating a market is as well much more costly than it might uh, seem. Yeah, it's, it requires more than a few articles in, in the press and a few TV spots. Yeah, um, so it's all coming down to the nature of, uh, of the business model and also what fits best to oneself. And to be very honest in this round, the least thing I wanted to do was getting investors on board again. Yeah, because I promised myself that I will never navigate myself into this situation, into this position of weakness, yeah, where I'm dependent on external capital flows. But then just facing the ugly truth that is what are the requirements to make a business model a success that is access to capital and then it actually comes down to the question who are the right partners on board yeah and um, I can only say that like investors doing a due diligence um, on companies it's our duty as entrepreneurs to do due diligence on and with the investors as well yeah to like being really sure like whom are we actually willing to sell a share of the company to? Um, and, and this maybe answers uh, the, the, the question best, yeah? Just like to um, be very realistic, what is required to build a certain scale? Um, and at the same time, choosing, choosing the right partners for, for that, right partners being like, not picking up dump money on the street. I mean, there's a lot of capital out there at this moment, um, but really um, making sure that every investor is 100% mission aligned, um, is 100% aligned in what it takes to build such a company. Um, very realistic expectation management wise with regards to timelines, with regards to, yeah, margins for error in, uh, in that. Thank you. Um, also from a personal experience, I can share that. Um, we had investors at uh, Chao, the company that nobody knows anymore <laughs> because it's not existent. Um, back in the 90s, uh, Sigrid mentioned that. And those investors, um, we at the time love to take on investors, you know, because uh, we, are, we were poor little um, students and there were people providing us with money so we could go and play. Um, but very, very soon we learned that this money is actually a little bit of a poison pill because the investors who, um, in our case, were like two years older than we, told us how to run the business. Um, and at Trivago, we had a totally opposite experience. We had entrepreneurs as investors like Ali Zamber and Florian and others. Um, and, and they understood that uh, as, as a very famous venture capitalist from the Valley once said, you invest in people. Um, and, and if you don't trust the people to run their business, um, you should uh, reconsider if you actually want to invest. 
And that was a very good experience that we had in my, in my second startup um, where we had Entrepreneur's Day. We're of course looking at the data and numbers and KPI, but as long as we somehow met them or let's say it was going in the right direction, because as you said, revenue is never as big as you uh, hope for and costs are always higher, um, then, um, then they were fine, they were okay and supportive. Uh, now, now, Dirk, why did you choose to go IPO? And, and what has changed since then in terms of your, um, yeah, the way how you lead your, your company? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so as you uh, may know, we also raised quite a lot of venture capital, broke capital and whatever capital. So <clears throat> we raised over 100 million pre-IPO um, because we had a wide, quite capital intense business. Um, if we, um, I think if you want to become a market leader in, I don't know, five to 10 years time, um, it is really hard. Either you're a genius with a brilliant idea, which I wasn't, um, so, or you need a lot of money. And um, uh, so uh, we raised that money <clears throat> and we had basically in our cap table, a lot of different investors, different interests and so on. And we had a management team and um, founder and other people in the company that really have been convinced or were convinced at the time that the story is not over, right? So we didn't want to sell. Um, also in our business um, or in our industry, we only had realistically one, two um, strategic investors or strategic uh, buyers Right, because we've already been so big. So we're number three in Germany. Industry is quite fragmented. Um, so there's only one or two companies that could have bought us. Um, I didn't want to work with private equity. Um, um, and therefore, um, I would say to align all the interests, um, get new funding for quite a long time, um, allow investors to sell when they want um, at, an, I would say, an illiquid environment and um, provide further growth for the business. Um, we chose going public. Um, to be fair, <coughs> I think there, um, the IPO window because of COVID and so on opened up dramatically. Um, so we did hurry um, to go um, public um, mid of last year. At the moment, that wouldn't be possible anymore. Right? Um, not because of us as a company, but just the capital markets are um, um, very different, or the, the public market, very different than private market. And um, I mean, yes, we, we went public at 25 euros. Now we are at nine euros something, the share price. Um, so, which is obviously not great if you need to talk to investors that invested at the IPO of, at 25 euros. Um, I think still it was the right thing to do, right? And um, um, at least once in, it, uh, in the lifetime of Mr. Specs, we had a great timing and um, we had, a, 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 I would say, a good storytelling approach. Um, I'm not worried about the, the share price because we have funding for five years plus and um, the business is going to the right direction, right? Um, but I think that you need to understand when you sometimes bring bad news to public markets, um, one percent of the trading volume impacts your share price um, dramatically. Um, it goes both ways, but um, that's another, I would say, thing that you need to um, be able to manage yourself in terms of tech psychology as a founder. And <clears throat> you need to decouple, I would say, the share price development, which you can probably um, um, uh, get real time um, hundred times a day if you want but uh, you shouldn't. And um, uh, so therefore, um, I would say that that was the reason why we went public. Um, but maybe one experience I want to share as well, I mean, Tanya mentioned it, um, she didn't want to have investors in, in, their, in her company. I have sometimes had other entrepreneurs um, coming to me and asking me for advice. I don't know why, but uh, then they, um, I always challenge them, why do you want to raise money from VCs? Um, why isn't there a an, better, a smarter way to finance your business, right? And um, because once you tapped in that hamster wheel, um, um, there's no way out. So you need to just move on and um, you need to create and grow um, a business. 
And then one day you need to either sell it or in, I would say, ideal scenario, IPO it. But the investors will always push you to spend more money because they only make money if you grow. Otherwise, they don't. Yeah, it's, it's a love-hate relationship, right? Um, on the one hand, I mean, you always have to be aware that the investor signs investment contract, they turn around, they want to sell you again because this is how they make money. So they will always push for the high valuation, which means higher growth and taking on more risks with uh, what for some entrepreneurs actually isn't the way to go. I mean, um, I think what is important for, for inspiring or people who want to start up a company um, to understand is you don't need to have a unicorn. I mean, I, I think it's not the right aspiration personally to say I only start if it becomes a unicorn. Because then your motivation said when things get tough, it might be you lose out the possibility to become a unicorn and you leave uh, because you only want to do work on a unicorn. It's, um, I see a lot of success with um, founders who are into the product, really understand the product. And let's see wherever it takes me. Of course, with the growth aspiration, but uh, not being too sad if it's only a, 1 million business or 10 million business or 100 million business don't necessarily need to become a, a unicorn. Um, well, when you're looking at um, advice, what would be at the current point in time be the one single most important advice you would give to people who are young, let's say in the, in the early 20s who are not quite sure whether starting up their company is the right choice? or whether you know, to go working for some corporate or consulting firm or do something else before that. What's your single most valuable advice that you would see, um, Dirk? I mean, as you said, since I'm also educated by the entrepreneurs organization, I don't give advice right, um, to entrepreneurs. So I would say, what are my learnings? Um, um, I think for me, um, it was great to, um, <coughs> in my internships in startups, um, eBay, Yamba at the time, to learn that I actually like to have this responsibility, uh, responsibility and ownership for the topic and drive it. And that actually motivates me. Um, I think that is one of the... Um, things, if you don't basically feel comfortable with that, then it's probably hard to become an entrepreneur. And um, the other thing, maybe uh, one more, at my entrepreneurship class, um, at the time taught by Malte Brettel, um, he always gave us the advice, um, if you want to become an entrepreneur, um, think about making all that costly mistakes um, on the PL of somebody else. Um, so start somewhere else, um, go into consulting, go to a startup um, and try out um, um, and let them pay for your mistakes. Thank you. Um, Malte is a really, really inspirational guy, actually, still to these days. Um, now I posted it uh, with the RWTH Aachen, one of the you know, big entrepreneurship hubs if you're going for the huge universities. Tanya, what would be, uh, sorry, not your advice. Uh, what would be something that you learned what was most important for you? Yeah, so my most valuable experience uh, to sticking to, the, uh, sticking to the system is indeed gaining firsthand experience. Yeah, um, and um, so gaining experience by speaking to as many people as possible yeah, um, to overcoming this fear of not wanting to talk about an idea just because um, it might be too risky uh, that someone else comes and does a copycat or so. While there are definitely cases, unfortunately, out there, um, it's fortunately not the norm. Yeah. So um, really uh, speaking, speaking to people um, uh, is, is one thing, but then also applying a filter for feedback because once you ask people, once I ask people um, for for their opinion, people 
will share their opinion and it can be like um, in alignment with my my opinion or not so um, really like to build a build, build a filter system uh, for that um, is um, has been super super helpful um, and then yes but also building upon um, upon what uh, like Malte shared uh, I also know this this talk uh, definitely one of the best uh, best watches best things to watch um, really seeking the environment yeah and just um spending spending some time um in this this environment um helps uh, help, helps most help me most thank you very much uh, for sharing the experience um yeah i think the important part is really that um or i'm a i'm a strong believer if you cannot try it out yourself is uh, role models. So what, what we started many, many years ago, and um, you've been part of that as well, is the startup career fair. What we do is um, in the very first weeks of a, of a program, of a study program, we invite HHL entrepreneurs um, to actually talk about their experiences. And the thing is what we experience is, you know, for the startups, there, there are two main, main motivations. First of all, startups typically need people. Right, they need uh, uh, people that are driven and where you know you can give them a task, and then you know they just do it. So you're looking for interns, you're looking for graduates. Um, but the second motivation I learned is to go back and to give something back, to motivate other people to actually um, think about entrepreneurship. Maybe not now, maybe after a couple of years of paying down your debts. Um, and um, and and I believe that that this, the, this role model aspect is important. I mean, typically when we have younger founders coming to the startup career fair, you, you have students there saying, I, you know what, that guy, this girl, uh, she's not that much older than I am. And she's not much better looking than I am. Maybe she's smarter, but let's see, let's find out. And, and the more, students relate or the more people relate with somebody who's on stage as a role model talking about the experiences the more they actually can um, think about trying it out themselves because again coming coming back to the point our school system in germany is anti-entrepreneurship our society in germany is anti-entrepreneurship so we get a lot of people coming to us asking you know, even coming to HHL and, and saying, we want to do career A, B, C, entrepreneurship. Yeah, I know I have to study that. There are some courses I have to take, but, you know, leave it our way. Uh, I, I'm not interested. And during the program, we experience that um, at the end, people, a lot of people actually change their opinion from going for a lifelong corporate career to actually at least having the idea in mind, maybe, maybe now, but maybe also later, I will go into entrepreneurship because it sounds cool, because it offers opportunities. And, and even those guys who are, there are some people who are just um, financially motivated, even those guys, you can tell about, you know, the top 100 list or the top 500 list of um, Forbes or manager magazine of the wealthiest people in Germany, for example, uh, they are entrepreneurs. Right, so there are a lot of a lot of uh, aspects, and um, let me also share one one thing that um, Michael Peterson has been telling us when he was joining us. Michael Peterson um, and was joining us in one of the courses. Um, Michael Peterson is an HHL alumnus who was a co-founder of Spreadshirt. Uh, Spreadshirt is a mass customization sustainable fashion company. Let's say it like that. So you can design, for example, your own T-shirts. Uh, quite successful with over 500 employees based out of Leipzig. And, and, and he said once in an entrepreneurship course, guys, if you are risk averse, and a lot of people say, I don't want to start my company because I, you know, I'm afraid it could fail. But he actually told us, um, if you're risk averse, then you should start up your company. Because if you go and work for Siemens, you got your paycheck. And that's it. There's nothing more. And because of some corporate restructuring, some uh, uh, I need to save money initiative, you lose your job, you have lost your one single stream of income. 
as an entrepreneur, you work on your business model. So maybe you have one stream where you say, I sell stuff. And then you have a second stream of income where you say, I service what I sell. Then you build something, you develop a competency like Amazon, they started selling books online. Now their bigger business is actually their IT cloud business, AWS. Yeah, so, so, so if you build new companies and over time as an entrepreneur, you have the possibility to build up several money streams. And if one breaks down, you still have the others. So, so the point he was making is, uh, of course you can fail. I mean, but you can lose your job. Um, but if you're risk averse, think about entrepreneurship. And that, that was really thought provoking from my perspective. Maybe some, some closing remarks, um, Tanya, thank you for being with us today. Is there anything else you want to share with us? Um, thank, I find it super encouraging that the, uh, like the initiatives, I mean, um, HHL has always been a trailblazer in fostering entrepreneurship, yeah, and in contributing, um, contributing significantly to uh, building this uh, ecosystem. Um, and uh, honestly, I just wish like we had these cores uh, early back back in the days. <laughs> um, so I think it's uh, it's it's just um, it's it's just the one logical next step, yeah, um, to to level up the the ecosystem. Thank you, and uh, Dirk. Yeah, I'm always bad in famous last words. So um, <laughs> I think it's, um, I think, uh, like Sanya said, I think it's it's great that you're holding up the flag there um, and uh, basically help to grow entrepreneurship. Um, I think what I learned from HHL that you can reach out to almost everybody from the HHL alumni network. Um, and ask them a question, um, ask them for true feedback and so on. And you get um, quite many responses, right? Um, I never got any rejections or so. Um, so I think that is also some kind of culture that um, HHL has been building up over many years and is still doing um, and use that. Right? Thank you very much. Actually, I do have, uh, yes. sorry, Dirk, what you just said reminded me of one, uh, one metaphor um, that I always, like how I uh, always like to look at things. So um, in the end, HHL and this entire network and community is a gym and not a spa. So we always get what we're given. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and this is, um, if it's like, uh, it's, I mean, it's like any, any network, um, but um, it's just, I mean, Everything is there. Uh, we we just have to to seize it, yeah. And uh, and this is what um, what, what I always find differentiates this network and this community from uh, from many others out there. I love it. <laughs> you see, okay. so much better. Famous last words. <laughs> I love it. I I, 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 I really wow. Um, yeah. Uh, then for me, it just uh, remains to hand over to Secret again, who did the introduction, um, to maybe summarize and uh, give us our next steps. Perfect. First of all, thank you to all of uh, all of you guys, to you three speaking and giving us so many mental notes. I was jotting down uh, my my little notebook, uh, what I should be taking away. Um, absolutely amazing to see that the network and that HHL has given all of you so much to actually start your businesses, um, to get that courage, to ask the right questions. Like Tanya said, um, not asking uh, why not, but uh, actually, yeah, not, not why, but why not, uh, or who if not me, um, absolutely good. And I'm glad to hear that the shift in Germany is um, proceeding, that we're becoming more entrepreneurial friendly than we've been in the past. I was glad to hear that. And um, it's amazing to know that the peer groups are helping you up to this day, Dirk. Um, it's good to hear that the alumni network, obviously uh, very much important for me, knowing that the work is actually um, flourishing and it's actually paying off, knowing that the alumni are supporting each other and that there's never been a shut door in front of your face. Uh, so very glad to hear that. Everybody, thank you for your time. And Tanya, Dirk and Stefan, Stefan also to you. Thanks for running at the show tonight.